It is great to be with you today. Uh, I do have to just sort of give you a heads up on the message though, uh, that my message today is really just for the guys in the room, just for the men, young or old, married or single, a dad or not, even a teenager, a student, because someday, most likely, you will be married and a dad. So what I have to say today is really specifically for the men in the room. Now, for the women in the room, don't check out on me. I need you. Actually, you're the ones who probably will benefit most from what I have to say. Some of you might be thinking, man, I, I wish my husband were here, or my brother, or my dad, or my boyfriend, or my ex could be here to hear this, and, and frankly, I, I wish they were here too. I get it. But I can only talk to the men who are in the room. So while I preach, girls, you pray, and pray that the Lord speaks to us into our hearts. Guys, I just want to shoot straight with you today. I like it when people talk straight with me, so I'm not going to couch things in sweet terms. I just want to, I'm just going to aim for the head. <clears throat> and talk with us, talk to you today about your life. God has no intention of allowing you to live a meaningless life. God doesn't do anything meaninglessly. And he has put you on this planet and in your world because he has a plan and a purpose, a specific intention for you that he wants to fulfill in your life. So I'm hoping today that you will hear this message as a call to destiny, as a call to greatness, as a call to purpose for your life. Some of you have been following Jesus for a long, long time. Others of you are just getting started. I've been following Jesus since I was six years old. Now, I had some years when I was, shall we say, developing my testimony yeah, you laugh because you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Some of you are just getting started. Some of you don't even know where to begin. But wherever you are in your walk with the Lord, some of you might even be here as a last resort. I know there's at least one guy here who's here against his will because I saw the skid marks from the heels of your shoes out on the sidewalk. But for whatever reason you've come here today, whoever brought you, I believe that you're here because God brought you here. God is always ahead of us. And I believe that this, your being here today, this is part of his plan for you. And that he has something he wants to say to you today. I believe that God wants to talk to you about an awakening. If you want to look at the first verse in your outline, then it's here on the screen as well. It's from Romans chapter 13. This will be our theme verse today. It says, and do this, understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. He says, do this. Now, what is he talking about? What is the this that he's saying we are to do? Well, he says it in the next verse, in verse 12. He says, the night is nearly over, the day is almost here, so let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. He's talking about integrity. He's talking about a commitment to being a godly man. He says, do this understanding the present time. So what is the present time? The ancient Greeks had two different words that they used for describing time. One was the word chronos, the other was the word kairos. Chronos, it's where we get the word chronology or a chronograph, like a watch. Chronos time is just the passing of seconds into minutes, into hours, into days, into weeks, and months, and years. Just the passing of time. In a life, it's you wake up, you go to work, you come home, you go to bed, you wake up, you go to work, you come home, you go to bed. It's just one day after another after another. It's just the passing of time. That's chronos time. But in this passage, Paul uses the kairos word. And kairos is a very different kind of time measurement. Kairos is a limited period of time. 
It's a decisive moment in time, something that must be seized, where action must be taken because there's a limited window of opportunity. Kairos is a critical moment in which history can be changed. So I want you to write this down in your notes. A Kairos moment is a turning point that must be pressed through to achieve its God-intended purpose. A turning point that must be pressed through to achieve its God-intended purpose. A turning point is when you are heading one direction and something happens, an event, a person, a tragedy, an opportunity, a decision. You're heading one direction, something happens, and now you're heading in a different direction. That's a turning point. And a Kairos moment is a turning point that must be seized and pressed through to achieve its God-intended purpose. An example of a turning point in a life, of a Kairos moment, would be getting married. That's a change in life. Having your first kid, that's a whole new direction. A change in career. I had a change in career. I went from the music business to being a pastor. Talk about a change, a turning point. On a, on a grander scale, a larger scale, a turning point for us in, in American history, well, actually in human history, was landing a man on the moon. 9-11 was a turning point, a Kairos moment, where history was reshaped and changed. The greatest Kairos moment in history, of course, was the coming of Jesus, his death and resurrection, because that changed everything. That was the change from B.C. to A.D., the way we keep track of all time. So a Kairos moment is a turning point that must be pressed through to achieve its God-intended purpose. And this weekend, today, could be a Kairos moment for you, my friend. Today could be the day that all of your life has been pointing toward. Today could be the day that you will look back on in the future and say, it was that day, something changed, a decision, I made a decision, I made a commitment, and it shifted the direction of my life. So I wanna to talk to you today about an awakening, and then I'm gonna challenge you to make a decision and to make a commitment. Paul says, the hour has come to wake from your slumber. I want to tell you a story about a man who slept through a Kairos moment. It's a story that you might remember from your childhood, the story of a man named Rip Van Winkle. It was written by Washington Irving in 1819. And the story of Rip Van Winkle is that he was a friendly, lovable, lazy Dutchman who lived at the foot of the Catskill Mountains in upstate New York in the late 1700s. And one day, in his attempt to escape the pressures of life, in his attempt to avoid having to make some important decisions, Rip Van Winkle wandered up into the mountains and he lay down on a grassy knoll and he went to sleep. And he slept for 20 years. When Rip Van Winkle fell asleep, King George III was the monarch over the American colonies. But when he woke up 20 years later, George Washington was president of the United States. So here's the point of the story. Rip Van Winkle slept through a revolution. The world around him changed and he wasn't even paying attention. He missed the whole thing. He dozed off in an attempt to escape an important decision, to escape the pressures and responsibilities of life, the real important things. He dozed off to escape those and woke up not realizing that everything was now different, that he had missed an opportunity, he had missed the change, and he was still pledging his allegiance to a defeated power. He still pledged himself to the King of England, even though it was a whole new country. He was looking for signs of the good old days, trying to make sense of this new world, and so he just went back to his lethargic and lazy ways. I have to ask you, my friend, is that you? 
Are you sleeping spiritually, spiritually dormant, unaware, maybe even apathetic to what God is doing in the world around you? It might not even occur to you to sit up and look and to see what is God doing? What difference does he want to make in my life? Are you still living under the dominion of a defeated power? Living by old values, thinking in old ways, not realizing that you have been set free by a new king. It is time for you to awaken from your slumber and to join your brothers in what God is doing in the world. There's a call on your life. The Bible says this in Colossians chapter one, that God has rescued us from the power of darkness and has brought us into the kingdom of his son whom he loves. His son paid the price to free us, which means that our sins are forgiven. So you don't have to live under the weight of your past anymore. Your past has not ruined God's future for you. I'm gonna say that again. Some of you need to hear this. Your past, no matter what it is, your past has not ruined God's future for you, but you must wake up to it and step into it. The Bible says the hour has come for you to wake from your slumber. And I believe that that's why God brought you here today, because God is inciting a revolution. It is not a political revolution. It's not a cultural revolution. It's a spiritual revolution. It's not a revolution in the streets. It's a revolution in the hearts of men where God is bringing freedom and purpose and destiny and calling us to be the men that he intended for us to be when he created us. That revolution is already underway. What is at stake is your soul. Your eternal destiny is at stake. The spiritual health and direction of your family, of your kids if you have them, your legacy is at stake. This revolution started 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ rose from the dead and defeated the powers of death and sin and hell. So there is a new king. His name is Jesus. And with a new king, that means there's a new kingdom. And where there's a new kingdom, that means there is a new economy, there is a new set of values to live by, a whole new value system. There's a new way of living, a new way of thinking about yourself, about God, about the world around you, about your family, about your purpose, about eternity, a whole new way of thinking, a whole new way of doing things. A new king is now in power. And the kingdom of God, as Jesus said, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's close enough to touch, to get a grip on. And if you have not joined this revolution yet, this spiritual revolution, I have news for you today, my friend. Today, this revolution is coming to you. Today could be the Kairos moment for you. Today is the day for you to wake up to what God is doing, to wake up to truth, to wake up to God's love, to wake up to his power, to wake up to the full meaning and implications of the resurrection in your life, to wake up to the fact that God indeed has a plan and a purpose for your life that he has called you into, he wants you to step into, he wants you to rise from your slumber and to shake off, sweep away the cobwebs of lethargy and carelessness and to take your place with your brothers in the kingdom of God. So what are you gonna do about it? You gonna sleep through my message? Wake up when it's over? Oh, wasn't that nice? Lovely sermon, pastor. And then just go back to your old ways. Or will you rouse yourself from spiritual slumber and step into a whole new life? Let's look again at this verse from Romans chapter 13. And do this, understanding the present time, the kairos moment that is upon you, 
the turning point that must be pressed through. Do this understanding the present time. The hour has come. It is now for you to wake from your slumber, to rouse from obscurity and inactivity. The hour has come to wake from spiritual dormancy because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Let's look at that verse in the message paraphrase. It says, don't get so absorbed and exhausted in taking care of all your day-by-day obligations that you lose track of the time and doze off, oblivious to God. The night is about over and dawn is about to break. Be up and awake to what God is doing. Be up and awake to what God is doing. What's he doing? He's calling you to a deeper level in your walk with Christ. He's calling you to a higher level of integrity and accountability with himself and with others. He's calling you to a broader, wider reach of your influence for his kingdom. He's calling you to be a man who lives by convictions, not for convenience. He's calling you to be a man who lives not just by your word, but a man of his word but it all hinges on your commitment. We're gonna look at a Kairos moment that happened in the lives of God's people in the Old Testament. We're gonna spend the rest of our time together here looking at a passage from Joshua chapter 24. But I wanna give a little background to this passage of what's happened leading up to this moment. It's a Kairos moment. Moses has led the people out of bondage in Egypt led them into freedom, led them through the desert. Moses has died. Joshua has now taken over. Joshua has led the people into the new land, the promised land, to take possession of the promised land. Now Joshua is about to die. And so as we come to chapter 24, this is Joshua's farewell address. And he has called the men together. And he is issuing them a challenge as they get ready now to step into their future. He's challenging them to an intensified commitment and to a renewed dedication to integrity, to step up in their commitment to God. He's challenging them to not just exist, but to fully possess this promised land that God has given to them. And as we're about to see, for the people to possess the land collectively, they must remain faithful individually. For the people to worship God corporately, they must worship him privately and individually. The eternal truth here is that the church is only as strong as its people, as their commitment to God. And for us today to possess the land means to fully engage in and to live out the fullness of life in Christ where your enemy, the devil, has been subdued and you're no longer living by his values, but you're now living according to God's values and you are making a difference with your life in the world around you for the kingdom of God. So in verse one of this chapter, it says, then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, the leaders, judges, and officials of Israel and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshiped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve whether the gods of your forefathers beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. I want you to notice four things about Joshua's challenge in verse 15. Write these down. The first is this. The choice he's calling them to, the choice is intentional. It is intentional, it's not accidental. He says, choose for yourselves whom you will serve. Nobody can choose for you. 
Your wife can't choose for you. Your friends, your parents cannot choose for you. It's your choice. You cannot follow the Lord accidentally. You can't follow him incidentally. It must be deliberate. It must be an intentional decision. Choose this day who you will serve. And second, the choice is urgent. He says, choose for yourselves this day, today, right now, in this kairos moment that must be pressed through to achieve its God-intended purpose. He didn't say, oh, let's talk about this, then take a couple of days, go home, mull it over, decide, then we'll come back and see what you think. He says, no, the time is now. Choose this day whom you will serve. The third thing to notice is that the choice is unavoidable. It is unavoidable. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Because by intention or default, you are going to serve somebody. Bob Dylan had it right in his song when he said, it might be the devil and it might be the Lord, but you're gonna have to serve somebody. Because you will. It is inevitable. Joshua says, if serving the Lord is undesirable, then decide who you will serve because you're going to serve someone. Jesus said this in talking about who you're going to serve. Matthew 6, 24, he said, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot, he says, you cannot serve both God and money. So the choice is unavoidable. And fourth, the choice is generational. It's generational because he says, as for me and my house. So let me tell you what else is at stake. Your kid's future is at stake. Again, those of you who have kids or hope to have kids, listen up. I just read a study this week from 2016, a study done by the Swiss government, and I have found others that say the same thing. And what they found is that if a man is not a follower of Christ, if he's not a follower of Christ, there is just a 2% chance, one in 50, a 2% chance that his kids will become followers of Christ regardless of the faith of the mother. Just 2% if you, the man, are not a follower of Christ. On the other hand, they found that if the man is a follower of Christ, that 2% climbs as high as 75% chance that the children will become followers of Christ. Again, regardless of the faith of the mother. There is so much at stake, guys, we have to wake up and pay attention to this. It is your choice, it's your decision. Joshua says, as for me and my household, as long as we're under this roof, he's saying, we're gonna serve the Lord. Joshua is taking responsibility for his household, for the values that they're gonna live by, and for the God that they are going to worship. And so in verse 16, the people respond. It says, the people answered, we too will serve the Lord because he is our God. We will serve the Lord. And then Joshua said, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Now then, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord. To yield here means to totally surrender to fully lay it down. He says, throw away the foreign gods among you and surrender, yield your hearts to the Lord. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and obey him. So the people responded and said, yes, we're in. We'll do this. And in essence, Joshua says, prove it. You need to do something about it. He says, throw away the foreign gods that are among you. Now, what are these foreign gods that he's talking about? Well, he actually told us back in verse 15. I put the verse here on the screen. Let's look at it once again. He says, they're the gods your forefathers served or worshiped in Egypt, 
and the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. Those are the foreign gods. So how does that apply to you today? Well, write this down. The gods of Egypt are the gods of my past. They're the gods of my past. He's saying by worshiping old gods that they are holding on to old values. They are bringing old lifestyles. They are carrying the remnants of their slavery with them into their future. And Joshua says, you gotta let go of that stuff. Get it out of your life. I have to ask you, what enslaved you before you gave your life to Jesus Christ? God is saying, walk away from it. Don't bring it with you anymore. Not a remnant of it, but leave it behind you. Get rid of the gods of Egypt. And the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. Here's what this means for your life. The gods of the Amorites are the gods of my culture. They're the gods of my culture. He's saying don't worship the gods of the culture in which you're living either. Don't bow your knee to those things. Don't live by the value system of the world around you because there is such a high price to pay if you live according to the world's values. Look at these next two verses in your notes. Jonah 2.8 says, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. And in 2 Kings 17.15, it says, they followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. So here's the question that we have to ask. Am I holding on to something, either from my past or in the world around me, the value system of the culture around me that is causing me to forfeit the fullness of God's grace in my life, in my marriage, in my family, in my finances, in my business? Is there something I'm holding on to that is keeping me from getting a grip on what God really wants to do in my life? God has called each of us into a whole new way of living. The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians 5, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, and a new life has begun. But in order to live the new life, in order to follow the Lord, in order to fully possess the land, this new life that God has called you into in Christ, then we must abandon the old gods, the gods of the past, the idols, the values, superstitions, beliefs, spiritual behaviors and practices that are not biblical. We must cease those things and get them out of our life. We must refuse to worship the gods of our culture. So what are the gods of our culture? What are the idols around us? What do those look like? And how do we serve them? Idols are false gods. They're not just little statues. Idols are things that you sacrifice to. An idol is anything that you allow to come between you and God. It can be a person, it can be a goal, it can be an accomplishment, it can be bitterness from the past, something that just clouds your view of what God wants in your life. An idol is anything that you allow to come between you and God. It's the excuse that says, yeah, God, I know, but I'm going a different direction. That becomes an idol. And he says we have to get those things out of our life, the lifestyles and behaviors that he wants us to walk away from. Paul tells us about this in Colossians chapter 3. He says, put to death, therefore, in other words, get out of your life, the evil desires at work in you, such as sexual immorality, indecency, lust, evil desires, covetousness, and greed, which is idolatry. All of these things that I just read about, they're all idolized in our culture. We see them in the movies. They're in all of our entertainment. We see them in our advertising. We see them in our news feeds. We hear about them in our music. 
And you might say, well, you know, what's the harm? It's sort of the new normal. There's great harm in it because it's costing you something. It's costing you the fullness of the grace of God. We must let go of these things and stop giving them our time and attention and affection. We have to stop living for those things and stop giving them your life. He says, put those idols to death. So how do you do that? Well, first you have to identify them. What are they? And a good way to identify any idols in your life is to look at your bank account and your calendar. Because those two things are the measure of your life. They'll tell you, how do I spend my time? How do I spend the resource that God has given me? How am I prioritizing things in my life? Those two things, your bank account and your calendar, tell you if there are any idols, any things that have come between you and God. You can tell what a man worships by the way he lives his life. You can tell the gods that he serves by the sacrifices that he makes. So I need to ask some tough questions. And I hope, I hope you know me well enough after all these years. I hope you know that I'm not coming to you today pointing a finger at anybody. I'm coming to you as a friend who cares about you. I'm coming to you as a man who has wrestled with and is guilty of every one of the things I'm about to talk about. But there are questions that we have to ask ourselves and take a good, hard look at our own lives. You're the only person who can answer these questions. And your answer is only between you and God. Nobody, it's nobody else's business. It's just between you and God. But are there any idols that you are sacrificing to? For instance... Are you sacrificing your family to an idol of success? Are you sacrificing your ethics to an idol of money or possessions? Are you sacrificing decency to an idol of indecent entertainment? Are you sacrificing moral purity to an idol of an immoral relationship? Are you sacrificing God's highest good for you to idols of past memories and lifestyles and behaviors that you're just not willing to let go of yet? And they're causing you to forfeit the fullness of God's grace in your life. An idol can be looking back at you from the mirror. You're trying to be your own God. Call your own shots. Do things the way you want to do them. Who's in charge of your life? Who are you living for? Are you living for yourself or for a higher purpose? For God himself. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. And Joshua's challenge to choose who you're going to serve As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He's saying, look, search your heart and look for anything you're hanging on to that is keeping you from fully possessing the land, fully possessing the new life that God wants you to have in Christ. So I'm finished with the hard questions. Let's find our way out of this. How do you get rid of an idol How do you break its grip on your life? You might want to write this down. You get rid of an idol by starving it to death. You starve it to death. You just stop sacrificing to it. Stop giving it your time and attention. You see, we pursue idols because of our passions. And the only way to get rid of an old passion is to get a new passion. Because when you feed a new passion, you find that you are now starving the old passion to death. You're not giving it your time and attention anymore because you're feeding a new passion. Let me give you an example. When I was 15 years old, a sophomore at Glendale High School, I had a passion for a cheerleader in my math class. She did not have a passion for me. 
So how did I get rid of my passion for the cheerleader in my math class? I got a passion for a cheerleader in my English class. <laughs> when you feed a new passion, you starve an old passion. When you feed your passion for God, you will find that you are starving your passion for the old ways of life, for the old idols that you were serving with your life, because now you're pouring more and more of your life into the object of your affection, the new passion that you have for God. Let me tell you some ways that you can break the, grips of, the grip of idols in your life. You can break the grip of an idol by changing the channel. You can break the grip of an idol by turning your computer around so that other people can see the screen that you're looking at. Guys, you can break the idol of lust by looking the other way when a woman is coming toward you. Now, she might think you're rude. It doesn't matter. You don't even know who she is. But it will break something of that idol of lust simply by turning your eyes in a different direction. You can break the idol of a grudge by praying for the person who hurt you because it is impossible to hate a man in God's presence. You can break the idol of materialism by living generously, by tithing, by living open-handedly and giving away the resource that God is putting into your hands. He gives to you so he can give through you. You don't hold it all for yourself, but you live open-handedly and generously. It breaks the idol. It breaks that grip of materialism. You can starve old passions by staying away from people and places that are harmful to you. As Rick always says, if you don't want to get stung, stay away from the bees. Here's a way to feed a new passion. Just stay home and be with your family. Joshua challenges all of us to a higher level of personal commitment and devotion. But he says, as for me and my house. So he's speaking not just for himself. He's now speaking for his family, his entire household. He's making a decision and a commitment on their behalf. And he's encouraging all of the other men to do the same thing. He's saying, step up, guys, and take responsibility for the spiritual health and well-being of your family. You cannot delegate your family's spiritual destiny. On Friday, I was having a conversation with Anthony Miller, one of our pastors here on the staff, about this very subject, and he told me about a study he had just read of, of teenagers, of kids, who were saying that they identified Lady Gaga and Kanye West as their biggest spiritual leaders. I know! You cannot delegate the spiritual health and future of your family you will either shape it or you will neglect it, but you cannot delegate it. Now, of course, your kids have to make their own decision. They have to decide for themselves who are they gonna serve. But remember, if you're not a follower of Christ, there's only a 2% chance that they're gonna follow Jesus. But if they see you as a man of God, if they see you as a follower of Christ, there is a 75% chance that they too will follow the Lord. So we have to do all that we can to raise them in an environment where they understand biblical values, where they understand that we live according to the ways of God. Let them see you spending time in the Word. Let them hear you pray, even if it's just at dinner. Bring them to church. Keep them in church. Buy them a Bible. Now, I know a lot of you are already doing these things. Keep doing them. The men that, God, that Joshua was speaking to was a mixed crowd of men. Some were spiritual leaders. Others were just ordinary citizens. But he was calling all of them to a deeper commitment that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You have to ask yourself the question, 
when my kids look at my life, and believe me, they do, do they think that God is essential or is he optional? And all of the people then responded to Joshua's challenge. They said that they too would serve the Lord. And having made that commitment, now Joshua calls them to create a memorial. Look what it says in verse 25. It says, on that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people. And there at Shechem, he drew up for them decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us, and it will be a witness against you if you are untrue to your God. And then Joshua sent the people away, each to his own inheritance. As I said when I started, we're all coming at this from different places in our spiritual life. Some of you have followed the Lord for a long time. Some of you are just getting started. Some of you have had your ups and downs. Some of you may not even know where to begin. But young or old or single or married, kids or no kids, my hope is that you're hearing me today not as a judge, please, but as a friend who cares about you, as a pastor who cares about this church, calling you to join me, to make a deeper commitment to be a godly man, because if there is one thing this world really desperately needs right now, it's more godly men. Are you with me, guys? Will you, are you willing to say, yes, I'm in, I know I won't do it perfectly. None of us does it perfectly. But I'm willing to step up and to step in deeper into this walk with Christ and to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If you're willing to do that today, then I want to ask you to do something. Joshua used a stone as a memorial to remind the men of the decisions that they made that day. And I like memorials, I think God does too, because you find them all throughout scripture. So I created a memorial for you. In your program, I put this card, has a stone on it. Now, I couldn't bring stones in for everybody here, so I just put them on a card, make it a lot easier to take them home. But on this card, at the top of the card, it says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then there's a line, a place for you to sign your name and a line for you to date, write down today's date. If you're saying, I'm in, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord, then I wanna invite you to sign this card. Take out a pen, sign your name, put the date on it, and then keep this card, take it with you. Don't put it in the offering plate. This is for you, it's not for us, it's for you. As a reminder, put it on your fridge. Put it in your Bible. You might even frame it and put it on your desk or on your bedside table. Or or take a picture of it with your phone and use it as the, the homepage on your phone as a reminder of a commitment that you're making that this day was the Kairos moment, that this day was the day that once again you said, I'm stepping up to this. I am seizing this opportunity to make this covenant before God to say, as for me and my house, will serve the Lord. I want to close by looking at our verse from Romans 13 one last time. And do this, understanding the present time, the hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. There's a famous childhood prayer we probably all have heard. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. If I should die before I wake, my prayer, my brothers, 
is that we will all wake before we die. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we are so grateful for your word, your eternal word. It is not just a history book, it is an eternal book. And for the life lessons that we learn from the people that you chose to to write about, for Joshua today who has challenged us to step up, to commit ourselves to a deeper walk with you, to be men of God, because this world so desperately needs godly men. So Lord, I pray for each man in this place that we will have the courage, the commitment, that we will wake up to what you're doing in our lives, that we will join this spiritual revolution and enter into, in a stronger, deeper way, the new life that Jesus has called us into. Father, I pray for the women in this room that you will speak deeply to them in the same way. For those women who have no man in their life, Lord, would you be their comforter, their friend, their God, their guard. Guide them through life. Lead them in the steps of devotion to you. That as they lead their kids, possibly without a father in the house, that they will see how to lead their kids into godly living as well. Lord, for each of us, may we be people of deep integrity who live according to our convictions that are built on the rock-solid foundation of your word. People who rid ourselves of the gods of the past and who refuse to worship the gods of our culture, but who worship only the living God in the name of Jesus Christ. I want to encourage each of you in this moment of silent prayer to take a moment and ask the Lord to search your heart and ask him, you don't have to be afraid of this, ask him, God, is there any idol that I'm still holding on to from my past? Is there an idol from my culture that I'm holding on to and serving with my life that is causing me to forfeit the fullness of your grace? Ask the Lord. And if he points something out to you, confess it to him. You say, yes, Lord, I see that. I confess it. I repent of that. And I'm turning from it today. It might be a relationship that you need to end. You might need to make a phone call when you walk out of here. Could be a decision that you have to make. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, God will give you the strength to make that decision. And if you've never opened your life to Christ, then in your heart, just pray this way. Say, God, I I don't understand all of it. I just know that I deeply need you in my life. I don't want to follow the old gods and the old ways anymore. But I want to make this declaration, first of all, for me, that I will be a follower of Christ, that I will serve you and for my family, Lord, as best as I can, I will lead my family to follow you too. I ask you to forgive me of my sins in the name of Jesus Christ and to put me on the pathway of the purpose that you've intended for me. That this day is my Kairos moment and I am seizing it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for checking out this message on YouTube. My name is Jay and I'm Saddleback's online pastor. I want to invite you to take your next step by checking out our online community or help get you connected to a local Saddleback campus. Three things we have to offer you right now. First, learn more about belonging to a church family by taking class 101. Second, don't live life alone and get into community with others by joining an online small group or a local home group in your area. Third, Join our Facebook group to be more engaged with our online community throughout the week. Take your next step and learn where a local campus is near you by visiting saddleback.com online or email online at saddleback.com. Hope to hear from you soon.